Welcome. My name is Alan Roberts. I am the Heritage Coordinator for St Andrew's Medieval Church in Bevington. Information on the history of the church can be found on the church heritage site at standrewsheritage.uk. This week the church will be open on Tuesday the 14th and Thursday the 16th of September between the hours of 10 and 3.30 with guided tours at 11 o'clock and 2 o'clock on each day. The church will not be open on Friday as advertised. St Andrew's Church had to close its doors to the community during the Covid lockdown so a new way had to be found to keep in touch with parishioners. It was time to adapt. This meant investing in new equipment so that services could be live streamed on social media. With all the uncertainties we've had over the past months, I decided rather than plan to open the church for my annual evening tour and then have to cancel because of restrictions, thus losing the opportunity of telling you of my research into the history of the workhouse. So welcome to this live broadcast from St Andrew's Medieval Church, Bevington. First, a few acknowledgements. My thanks to the Rector and Church Wardens of St Andrew's Church, Bevington, for allowing me to use the church tonight. Whittle Archives for the help they gave me while researching the workhouse. Dr J.B. Yeoman for his book on Clatterbridge Workhouse. My friends and colleagues on the heritage team here at St Andrews. And finally, Peter Higginbotham, who has researched the workhouse across the UK, publishing many books and placing them online for others to read and learn. To all those people I say thank you, because without them, I would have nothing to say. During my research, during my research, I started to realize that what I had found was the very beginning of the social system of today, which we call the welfare state, where for a relatively small amount of money taken from our pay, the state will look after our health and well-being. This also allows us the freedom to opt out of looking after our loved ones if we so wish and place them into care homes. During the present COVID pandemic, we suddenly found that we were not able to visit our relatives and friends in case we spread infections. The old neighbourhood system of looking after single or elderly people came back into fashion. New friendships emerged by helping others in, over the years. <coughs> In years gone by, our ancient relatives naturally took on the responsibility of looking after their sick and aged relatives when they came on hard times. The lucky ones went into an almshouse. The history of the almshouse goes back to the 10th century, where the poor and sick could obtain relief. I was also surprised to find that there is an almshouse association with 1600 almshouse charities still in existence today, which support 35,000 people and the Prince Charles has been their patron since 1992. The workhouse was supposed to complement or replace the almshouse, but taking on the additional responsibility of the unemployed and the vagrant. The workhouse was an institution that perhaps more than any other has left a deep emotional scar in the British nation. In the early years, the cruelty, starvation and death that took place in the workhouse system, which was supposed to look after those vulnerable people, left much to be desired. I say system in the loosest terms, because there was no organised system throughout the country. There were Acts of Parliament describing what should be done, but were then open to local interpretation with no supervision. The shame, even today, 91 years after the workhouse system was abolished, 
in 1930 still leaves many older people remembering being told as a child that they would end up in the workhouse. As if they didn't behave themselves or be kept asking for sweets. The shame also in later life of people who had been born into the workhouse and had it recorded on their birth certificates. This was recognised in 1904 by the Registrar General and in these cases they would insert a fictitious address on the birth certificate. For example, the Liverpool Union Workhouse was known as 144A Brownlow Hill. The Willow Union Workhouse was number 2 Clatterbridge Road and the Birkenhead Union was number 56 Church Road, Tranmere. If you have a relative wealth address on a birth certificate, it does not mean that they were born in a workhouse, but that in later years, the infirmary still used that address for registration purposes. The threat and stigma of the workhouse was enough of a deterrent for most people to start to help themselves. Many hospitals have their roots in the old workhouse infirmaries with some of the old grand looking buildings still in existence. Care for the sick and elderly and vagabond over six centuries has necessitated over 60 acts of parliament and amendments being passed. So we will look at a few of those acts and how they affected those that needed their help. The first legislation was when King Edward III, on the 18th of June, 1349, passed a law which is often considered to be the start of the English Poor Law. This was called the Ordinance of Labourers, 1349. Some say that it's also the start of the English Labour Law, as this was to fix wages and impose price controls, requiring all those under the age of 60 to work and prohibited the enticing way of another person's servants by offering to increase their wages. It also prohibited giving private relief to the able-bodied beggars so that they were made to work for their living. So in other words, you could not throw a goat into the hat for a beggar. The ordinance was issued in response to the 1348 outbreak of the Black Death during which an estimated 30 to 40% of the population died. The decline in the population left the surviving workers in great demand in the agricultural economy of Britain. Landowners had to face the choice of raising wages to compete for workers or let their land go unused. Wages for labourers rose and this then caused inflation across the economy as goods became more expensive to produce. A system for looking after the poor, sick and infirm, were never more important than in the Tudor period. The Act of Supremacy of 1534 confirmed the break of the Church from Rome and declared Henry VIII to be supreme head of the Church of England. Two years later, Parliament passed an act that many in the monasteries had feared. The act stated that any monastery with an income of less than £200 a year was to be dissolved and their property passed to the Crown. 300 religious houses fell within that category. Five years later, the second act of dissolution was passed, which provided for the dissolution of the remaining 552 monasteries and houses. The monasteries up to this period had provided work, food and shelter for the sick and the needy. With the loss of that support, many had to resort to begging, which was classed as a serious offence and punishable by beating, whipping or even slavery, which was actually where the beggars were forced to work long hours for their food and lodging without pay. To overcome this problem, the Act of 1536 required church wardens to collect voluntary arms in their parishes and to give relief to the poor, sick and needy. Also, to set the sturdy and the idle vagabonds to work. The same Act also required householders to voluntarily contribute to parish funds. 
suddenly this act was very little for the poor as people did not give to the church. By 1563, it became compulsory for householders to contribute towards the poor on the way. And 13 years later, it was stipulated that every town should prepare quantities of materials for the unemployed to work on, either at home or in workshops. These materials would be wool, flax, hemp or oakum, which was old growth impregnated with sea salt and tar. This was unpicked by hand and in that process it tore fingernails and skin. The fibres from the oakum were used to seal cracks between banks on ships. In addition, every county was to set up a house of correction for dealing with any able-bodied pauper who refused to work. However, the workhouse was never intended as a prison, but I do suspect that many actually were sent there for punishment. Over the years, many acts were passed and amended and finally thrown out, but it was Gilbert's Act of 1782 where a real change was proposed. The Poor Law Relief Act of 1782 was called an Act for Betterment, Relief and Employment of the Poor, and sometimes known as Gilbert's Act after its sponsor, Thomas Gilbert. It provided a simple procedure for groups of parishes to set up a common workhouse. It also introduced some insignificant changes in workhouse administration, including management by a board of guardians, appointed from the members of the parish and regulated by a visitor. The Act also included a set of standard rules under which workhouses were to operate, and this would give more accountability. However, these workhouses were only intended only to help the elderly, sick and the orphans. The able-bodied pauper were to be given relief in their own homes, or were to be provided with work with supplemented wages. Gilbert thought this was a more humane approach to the problem of the poor. This act worked quite well where it was implemented, but was not used countrywide. The government wanted to remedy that and appointed a Royal Commission in 1832 which made 22 recommendations that made it almost impossible to obtain any relief outside of the workhouse, which was a complete reversal of Gilbert's Act. This caused such a rumpus that the government eventually brought in the Poor Law Amendment Act two years later which was to replace all previous acts. It stopped the granting of outdoor relief to able-bodied persons and permitted them only to be assisted in the workhouse. The poor law commissioners based in London would oversee the act at local level. The poor law unions would contain 20 or 30 parishes or townships and would be run by an elected board of guardians who were also required to provide a workhouse for the poor and would be funded from the local poor rate. The inmates would be given clothes, which were a type of uniform, and food in the workhouse in exchange for several hours of manual labour each day. The families would be split up inside the workhouse and had, no fo and had to follow strict rules and were on a bad diet of bread and watery soup. The conditions were made so terrible that only those people who desperately needed the help would ever go there. The newspapers were describing the Paul Law Amendment Act as cruel and unchristian, and the workhouse as prisons for the poor. The poor became so scared of the threat of having to move <coughs> into a workhouse for help that in the north of England they rioted and attacked the workhouse. Many people thought that the act was wrong and it seemed to punish people who were poor through no fault of their own, for example the sick and the elderly. 
Many local fishermen felt that the old system worked well as it was. The taxes that people had to pay to look after the poor were low and the system was adapted to local area. Many people were also unhappy with what they said or what they saw as interference from London. So a quick look at some of the relevant acts. In 1847, the Poor Law Board, this had the task of cleaning up the system after the Andover scandal. This was where the inmates were found to be scavenging among the bones that they were supposed to be crushing. They were looking for bits of flesh to eat. 1905, the Royal Commission took four years to decide that change was needed and that the workhouse should go and be replaced with separate specialised institutions for children, the unemployed, the elderly and the mentally ill. In 1925, Neville Chamberlain, the Health Minister, believed that the poor law system needed to be reformed. However, after further two acts in 1929, an act was passed that was to mark the end of all the poor law authorities and transferred responsibilities to local councils. Though the workhouse was officially no more, many did carry on through the 1930s and even into the 40s under many different names. It was in 1946 that the National Health Service Act was passed but did not actually come into force until the 5th of July, 1948. The importance of the poor law declined with the rise of the welfare state in 1948. The Poor Law Amendment Act was repealed by the National Assistance Act of 1948, which then created the National Assistance Board to act as a relief agency. I have shown just a few of those acts and amendments that were passed to help the poor and the vulnerable. Looking back, it clearly showed that those in authority did not know how to handle, or in some case did not care, as long as it was somebody else's business, no problem. So let us now look at some of the local workhouses. Workhouse design tended to follow what became known as the cruciform shape with the admin block in the centre, which then segregated families. It also formed four individual exercise yards, men, women, boys and girls. This plan shows a typical workhouse layout, with a complete segregation of the family, with no count contact at all between family members. The master's room was in the middle, with male inmates to the right, women to the left, and the children were also segregated. In 1732, Liverpool erected a workhouse at the corner of College Lane and Hanover Street. In the report, this workhouse was described as a small building as additional space for 43 families were being housed in the old infirmary on Shaw's Brow at the cost of £21 per year. The infirmary or almshouse was situated on Shaw's Brow and shown here behind the Holly Fair in 1749. took another 30 years before a new and larger workhouse was built. This was bounded by Brownlow Hill and Mount Pleasant, where the Metropolitan Cathedral is today. A report on the workhouse explained that the new House of Industry on Brownlow Hill could house 600 inmates. The poor was partially maintained in the workhouse and partially relieved at home. The population in Liverpool Parish in 1773 were 34,407 and by 1790 it had reached 55,732 and up to 6,780 of these lived in cellars 
and 1,220 were in the actual workhouse. All people in particular would provide you with good lodging. Each apartment, if you could call it that, consisted of three small rooms, a fireplace, four beds in each room, and was habited by eight to ten persons. The most infirm lived on the ground floor. Others were distributed through the upper stories. They all dined together in a very large room, which occasionally served as a chapel. The children were mostly employed in picking cotton, and they were working 70 or 80 in a small room. About 50 of the girls were bound apprentices in sprigging muslin. Now sprigged muslin was muslin cloth with a pattern of small sprigs of flowers and foliage. A few old men were employed in trades such as tailoring and boat building. Other trades were also carried out. About 2,700 pensioners were also given relief outside the workhouse at a weekly expense of 56 pounds and nine shillings. The committee refu refused relief to such poor that kept dogs. In 1823, three remarkably long-lived workhouse residents died. Helen Tate, aged 110, Francis Dixon, 105, and Margaret Mackenzie, aged 104. On the 7th of September 1862, a serious fire broke out in the workhouse and destroyed the church and one of the children's dormitories. Sadly, 21 children and two nurses were burned to death. The Chester Workhouse. In 1571, a survey of each parish in Chester was made to find out how big a problem the poor and the idle were. They also ordered a special rate should be levied to erect a workhouse. Four years later, a building just outside the North Gate near the quarry in the Gorse Stacks was converted for this purpose. However, the parish remained the basic unit of the poor law administration. In 1691, a request from the church wardens of St Olaf's parish was made for the lease of land on which they wished to build a suitable building in order to set the poor to work. According to records, there was a workhouse in Hanbridge which belonged to St Mary's Parish and was in, in existence by 1730. In the same year, a poor house was established in St John's Parish. The Cathedral Workhouse was opened in 1751 and modelled on an existing workhouse in St Oswald's, Oswald's Parish. Later, in 1757, a voluntary union of parishes was formed by combining the nine Chester parishes to build a new combined workhouse. This was built by the corporation on waste ground belonging to them on the northwest side of the Rue D by the gasworks. The administration and control of this workhouse was passed to the mayor, recorder and alderman who were justice of the peace. There was also 74 other guardians chosen from the nine Chester parishes who were incorporated as guardians. I wonder how they managed to agree on anything during those meetings. All did not go well for the workhouse. On the 24th of February 1767, a disastrous fire broke out in a room used for spinning cotton. The building, which housed 200 children, in addition to the adults, was destroyed. There were 77 fatalities, which included 60 children, 12 men and 5 women. Later, an asylum for poor lunatics were added to the site in 1818 and a school for poor for children in 1823. In 1869, this voluntary union became the Poor Law Union of Chester by order of the Poor Law Board. This order united the nine parishes of Chester 
and a new union workhouse was built in Hull Lane in 1877. This contained five large blocks designed to hold 500 persons. In 1892, the site consisted of a workhouse, hospital, and an extra parochial chapel dedicated to St. James, which had been consecrated in 1880. In the early 1900s, children were removed from the workhouse into a central children's home, which was erected on the Wrexham Road, with smaller children's homes in Doddleston, Great Sorbel, and Upton. Looking on our own doorstep, the Whittle Union was formed by Richard Digby Neve, who was the Government Regional Assistant Poor Law Commissioner. With help from local landlords and landowners and clergy, he had to implement in the 1834 Poor Law Amendment Act. All the 56 townships in the Whittle Hundred were joined in the Union of Whittle, which covered an area of 74 square miles. On the 17th of May 1836, the Commissioners held their first meeting in Birkenhead, where they chose Sir William Stanley Massey Stanley, Baronet of Hooton and Stoughton, as their chairman. This has been said that he only ever attended one meeting. The Reverend Robert Mosley Fielden of St Andrews Bevington and Richard Jones Congreve of Burton were elected as vice chairman. It was later decided that they should purchase two acres of land at Clotterbridge Farm, which was on the road from Birkenhead to Chester, for the cost of £112.10 shillings, to build a workhouse for 130 paupers. Mr William Cole was asked to prepare plans and estimates for the building. The Union Workhouse, as you can see, was built on the countryside on its own, which I, as I, the idea was that it was the geographic centre of Wirral. This was William Cole's design for the Woodle Union Workhouse in 1836. The contract, worth £2,300, to build the workhouse, which would house 130 paupers, was given to a Mr Key of Neston. The final inspection of the new building was completed 12 months later and opened on the 1st of February 1838, with two women inmates from Little Sutton being admitted. When the building was first opened, it didn't seem to have any running water installed, as the water was drawn from the nearby stream until the well was dug in, 19, in 1839. This was to be four feet in diameter and ringed in brick. The workman was given one week to complete the job for two pounds, five shillings and sixpence. The sanitary arrangements were such as were in used in agricultural area, which basically meant it was a cesspit. There were no arrangements for bathing, as this was considered an instrument of torture and additional hardship for the inmates. It was also thought that the statement frequently made that a bath at birth and one after death was considered the right number for, life, for during a lifetime. It was reported in 1840, however, that the master and matron were to take the children to bathe at Bromborough, probably in the River Dibbing. In the Chester Observer, 26th of December 1896, at the fortnightly meeting of the Board of Guardians Clatterbridge Workhouse, the clerk reported having inquired into the feasibility of getting the water supply from the Whittle Water Company. This would entail laying a mile of pipe from Spittle Four Lane Ends for a cost of £300. This was 60 years after it was built and still no running water. The Whittle Union was floored from the start on two counts. First, Head and its townships should have been a separate union due to both its size and area and its growing population. The shady portion on the northeast corner was where the population was most dense. The second count was the original, 
Originally, Neve recommended the occupancy of the workhouse to be for 200 paupers. However, the Board of Commissioners decided on a cheaper option, which was only to use an occupancy of 130 paupers. The closer view of the workhouse in 1874 on the left shows very little difference in size, where on the 1908 map the original building has altered and new buildings to the north have been added to form a new hospital. This aerial view of the workhouse site in 1943 shows no sign of the old workhouse buildings which would have been left to the large chimney in the foreground. The hospital can be seen at the right hand behind the trees in the top right hand corner there. During the Second World War, the hospital was taken over by the Americans as a military hospital. The wooden and concrete huts were built to house the wounded. Part of the site was also used as a prisoner of war camp. The Lickenhead Poor Union in 1861, the growth of Birkenhead led to the establishment of the Birkenhead Poor Law Union, consisting of the fol following former Whittle Union parishes Bidston cum Ford, Birkenhead, Clotham cum Grange, Liscard, Nocturum, Oxton, Poulton cum Seacum, Tramier, and Wallasey, had a 13 strong elected board of guardians, four representing Birkenhead and two from Tramier, the rest one each. One of the first duties of the Board of Guardians was to select a site and build a workhouse. The site chosen was bounded by Derby Road, Elm Road and Church Road, close to St Catherine's Church in Tranmere. The design by Thomas Leyland could accommodate 500 inmates. The lower drawing shows the ground floor. We had a central entrance block on the ground floor with a committee room and a schoolroom at the rear. This enabled the inmates to be segregated, with men on the right, women on the left, and they were subdivided into able-bodied or infirm. On the first floor in the centre was the master's bedroom and a children's dormitory at the rear. The left wing held the infirm and able-bodied women in separate dormitories, the right wing held the men who were also segregated. The workhouse was officially opened in 1863-64. A trained nurse was employed some years after it had opened. Before that, it was the custom to appoint an able-bodied woman inmate to ascend to the sick. 1876 plan of the workhouse shows that the workhouse had ex extended its operations with a 200 place school for destitute children who were given education by a resident master and mistress. It is possible that the school master and mistress were also inmates and paid a nominal fee for their services. The plan also shows a hospital on the south side. This layout of 1914 shows the many improvements made to the workhouse site. The local church has now provided education for children in their schools, which enabled the school block to be converted into sanatorium. And additions to the hospital block, together with the purpose-built laundry, which was then staffed by inmates, made the site into a much needed facility. This picture shows a typical workhouse laundry in 1896. This photograph was taken of the old workhouse building from the Church Road entrance in the late 1990s. Nearly 150 years later, two carved stones are all that have left at the modern at the Birkenhead Union workhouse. The old buildings have been demolished to make way for a modern medical complex. The site has seen many changes in the medical profession since those days of a lay person administering to the sick and elderly. The 
two stones are a memorial to those who have passed through those doors, both medics and patients. The work has food. We are told that this menu is called the typical diet for an able-bodied pauper. For breakfast every day, oatmeal, hasty pudding, which is milk boiled up with flour or oatmeal, also called burgo. Dinner, milk, pottage and bread. A thick vegetable stew, served twice a week. Lobscouse, which is beef cut into small pieces and boiled with potatoes three times a week. Broth, beef and bread were given twice a week. In the, U in the new union workhouses, set up by the 1834 Polar Amendment Act, things were rather different, at least to begin with. The Poor Law Commissioners ordered that no extra food was to be allowed on Christmas Day or any other feast day. The rules also stated that no pauper should be allowed to have or use any wine or, por or porter. Christmas Day was a traditional occasion for a treat for most workhouse inmates. In the Bristol workhouse in the 1790s, the Christmas Day and with Sunday dinner included baked veal and plum pudding. In 1828, inmates at St Martin's in the Field workhouse received roast beef, plum pudding and a pint of beer. After the 1834 Poor Law Amendment, things were rather different. The Poor Law Commissioners ordered that no extra food was to be allowed on Christmas Day or any other feast day. And the rules also stated that, but, sorry, but by, 19, by 1840, the Poor Law Commissioners had revised their rules to allow extra treats to be provided, as long as they came from private sources and not from the Union funds. In 1867, the Bethnal Green Workhouse Gives a musical treat for inmates, and which was privately funded by the local guardians. So the people. The question that needs an answer is why did we have so many poor and destitute people living in the 18th and 19th centuries in what we now know as the Merseyside area? The city of Liverpool was a thriving hub of activity with ships sailing to the new lands of America, Australia and the African continent. The start of the Industrial Revolution, new factories, shipyards, docks, railways, imports and exports. There should have been enough work and money to eliminate poverty. So what went wrong? It could be said that the change came too quickly and did not allow the workforce to adapt to the new skills needed. The local population were mainly agricultural workers or were in service in the large houses of the merchants. Or perhaps the new ways were the victims of their own success. Word had reached beyond the local borders that Liverpool was, well, perhaps not paved with gold, but that the fortunes could be made. Large numbers of the Welsh had moved into Liverpool by 1782. It was said that as many as one in twelve people in living one in twelve people in Liverpool were Welsh. And by the end of the century, the Pall Mall area was known as Little Wales. Men from Anglesey ran building companies or worked as warehousemen on the docks. They lived in two up and two down cottages in Toxted. Liverpool even hosted four nationalised Stepfords and the last being in 1929, with Bergen Head holding two in, in 1897 and 1917. The Irish people had also heard the news, and they sailed across the Irish Sea to, see, sea to seek their fortunes. When disaster struck in 1845, with the, with the potato famine, that caused the death of 700,000 Irish by starvation. A mass exodus from the shores of a devastated island took place. Thousands went to America via Liverpool, but many stayed in the Docklands area of Liverpool. 
across the river in Birkenhead, the Birkenhead to Chester Railway was being constructed and was completed in 1840. New docks were built in 1844, requiring many navvies and there was no shortage of labour to take up vacancies. The construction of the Birkenhead docks finished with the opening of Morpeth and Edgerton docks in 1847. Any further work came to a sudden stop when they ran out of money, throwing the workforce out of work. Compulsory education in Britain did not start until 1872. There had been charity schools since the 16th century, mainly in the churches. I thought it fitting to include some of the many schemes that were used to help the young. It should be noted that a few poor law authorities set up establishments, also known as industrial schools, in the 1830s and 40s. These were specifically for the pauper, orphaned and abandoned children who had been taken into care or whose parents were in the workhouse. The Kirkdale Industrial School in Liverpool, although the workhouse system provided a safety net for destitute children and their families, there were other groups or problem children for whom different types of institutions were evolved. Two of the most important of these were industrial schools and the reformatories, which were from 1850s and catered for a wide variety of children. These included those who were neglected or whose parents were engaged in immoral or criminal activities, or who themselves had already committed criminal acts, which in more recent times would perhaps we would refer to as juvenile delinquents. Whereas the reformatory schools aimed to redeem those who had already committed an offence, Industrial schools were targeted as a slightly younger group who were considered in danger of drifting into criminal activity. Another in Liverpool was the Blue Coat School, which was founded in 1708 by Brian Blondell, a wealthy ship owner. Another scheme was the training ships, HMS Conway, April 1858, a committee was formed by the Mercantile Marine Services Association to establish a training ship on the River Mersey to train boys to become officers in the Merchant Navy. The Admiralty offered the use of the frigate Conway, a coast guard ship at Devonport. The first Conway proved such a success that a larger ship was needed to accommodate the growing number of cadets. So the Admiralty loaned a 51-gun frigate HMS Winchester in 1861. The two ships exchanged names, so HMS Winchester became the second HMS Conway. The training ship, indefatigable. 1863, Captain John Clint, a ship owner, saw the growing need to help orphan boys and sons of poor seamen to prevent them from going into the workhouse. He wanted them to have the basics of reading, writing and arithmetic, together with seamanship and be instructed in the principles of the established church. With the help of ship owners Thomas Ismay and William Inman, together with financial assistance from James Bibby, a committee was formed to explore how this could be achieved. They approached the Admiralty for the use of a ship, who agreed to loan the indef indefatigable a 50-gun frigate built at Devonport and launched in 1848. James Bibby gave £5,000 to transform the warship into a training ship for 200 boys. In 1864, the Indy, as she was known, came to moor in the Sloyne off Rock Ferry. 100 years after the school was founded, His Royal Highness, the Duke of Edinburgh, said that any boy Going through a school such as this is trained for leadership. The reformatory ships, the Clarence, the Reformatory Act of 1854 was for providing better care and reformation of the young offenders. 
Liverpool considered a reformatory for Catholic youth offenders, but it was the Father Nugent who formed the Liverpool Catholic Reformatory Association. They decided to establish a reformatory ship in the Sloyne at Rock Ferry. Once again, the Admiralty was asked for the loan of a suitable ship. The Admiralty had an 84-gun warship which had never been commissioned since her launch in 1827. She was brought to Liverpool where it was converted to accommodate 250 boys. The purpose was to educate and reform the boys so that they could enter the merchant, the merchant navy. The boys were instructed in seamanship, tailoring, together with reading, writing, arithmetic and geography. A chaplain was also appointed for religious instruction for the boys. The other ship, the Akbar, she was an ex-navy ship moored, moored in the Sloan of Rockery again and converted to accommodate 200 for the reform and education of Protestant boys in 1856. Akbar became shore-based in Heswell in 1909 and was known as the Heswell Nautical School and later renamed Akbar Nautical Approved School, which closed in 1956. So to sum up, the old system of the parish looking after its poor failed, and even the new acts to alleviate hardship failed, those most vulnerable people of our society. I've tried to give an overview of the poor law system, as there were so many different ways that local authorities could and did interpret the acts. I think it would be remiss of me, remiss of me not to mention the training ships that anchored in the River Mersey, which were a large success in giving boys some education and discipline and allowed them to gain employment. During the, during the Victorian era, the population of towns increased beyond all expectations. The parish church vestry, which was the forerunner of the district council, had no public funding or the expertise to manage those situations. People did what they thought was right at the time, good or bad. I leave you with this thought. Have we learnt anything over the past 480 years on how to look after our loved ones? I'm sorry that I'm unable to take your questions this evening, but I hope that I've given you a glimpse of how our society tackled a situation that would not go away. Thank you for taking the time to listen to my interpretation of what happened over the past 660 years. These thoughts are mine and have no connection whatsoever with St Andrew's Church. Thank you and take care from my heritage team here at St Andrew's. Thank you very much.